Hi everyone, and welcome to Exploring the Build. If you just found this place, then welcome. I'm Alex, and this is my channel where we theorycraft and explore different character builds for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Today we are continuing the Gloomhaven series of character builds, where we try to take the character classes from the hit board game Gloomhaven and recreate them in Dungeons & Dragons. With a Kickstarter for the Gloomhaven RPG having launched, I'm a little bit impatient and have decided to combine my love for D&D with Gloomhaven to tide me over until the RPG's release. For those who know Gloomhaven, we are going to be recreating each of the character classes from Gloomhaven, the Forgotten Circles expansion, Jaws the Lion, and Frosthaven. For any of the locked character classes, I'll be sure to add plenty of spoiler tags so that nothing is given away about any of the classes that aren't already considered public knowledge. Additionally, I'm not recreating each of the cards in particular for each character class, but rather looking at their main mechanics, the character art, and the overall theme for inspiration when trying to recreate the character class using D&D mechanics. For those who know D&D, since these builds are mainly theory crafting just for fun, there are times when I'll be using Unearthed Arcana in the builds. Unearthed Arcana is unofficial material, so it may or may not be okay depending on the DM, but if you'd actually like to use these builds in your game and want to get around the unofficial material, then I will be sure to add some replacement suggestions when needed. Today we are looking at making the Scoundrel in D&D. Overall, the Scoundrel is pretty much a backstabby rogue. They gain bonuses to damage when they can isolate an enemy, whether that's one-on-one -on -one dueling between the Scoundrel and that enemy, or if it, there's just more of the Scoundrel allies next to that enemy than the enemy's allies next to it. They can also throw daggers if they want, and they can apply a fair number of conditions. They specifically have an affinity for the poison condition in particular, though I don't know how reliably we're going to be able to emulate that as poison in Gloomhaven. It was very different than the poison condition in Dungeons and Dragons. Looking at all three of those things, we know that this is going to be a kind of unique build where we're still going to be focusing more on martial aspects as opposed to more spellcasting or elemental abilities. However, the fact that we were going to want to try and get a couple of conditions thrown in here is going to make this build a little interesting. Before we start with the actual build, though, let's look at some flavor text. Humans are by far the most dominant of the races, spreading across the continent like locusts, erecting extravagant cities and disturbing slumbering forces they can never hope to understand. The human society is one of rules and regulations, but also one of our great diversity. Due to their intense curiosity and relentless nature, humans can find themselves walking almost any path imaginable, from the obscenely wealthy noble to the unappreciated tavern cook, from the blacksmith forging rug rugged weaponry to the corrupted pursuant of dark magics. It is natural, then, that while many humans work to build up complex and constricting bureaucratic societies, there are others who reject such societies or even work to tear them down. Scoundrels are among this second type, wholly unscrupulous and self-serving. Scoundrels operate under the assumption that everything in the world is theirs to take, and they will do whatever is necessary to do the taking. Such an attitude manifests itself in combat through a vicious opportunism unseen in any other culture. Starting off with character creation for our scoundrel, we are going to look at the lineage. For our lineage, we're actually going to go with human variant this time. This is the first time we're not going with custom lineage, even though custom lineage could technically work if you wanted to use that instead. The Scoundrel is our first human class, and so even though this isn't as fancy of a background, it's still going to get the job done. Human Variant is going to give us a skill of our choice, which at this point I'll just say pick your favorite, because there's lots of skills that we're going to pick up anyways, so just an extra one that isn't going to come from our background or our class is going to be helpful. Feel free to hold off on it until you know what our background and our first class is going to be to pick your favorite skill, or just choose one that you think isn't probably going to get picked up that you still like. We also get to improve two of our ability scores by plus one each, and we gain a free feat. For the feat, we're going to take Poisoner. Honestly, the Poisoner feat is not the best, and many of you be, may be saying, what? Why would you choose that? Why not go Piercer or Mobile or any other feat that could be useful? And while those are fair points, my reasoning is this. The Scoundrel in Gloomhaven deals a lot with the wound and poison conditions, and while there's no way to recreate those conditions one for one in D&D, at least not off the top of my head, what we're probably going to do instead is say, okay, let's look at the versions that we have to work with, such as the poison condition in D&D, and let's make our Scoundrel really good at creating that condition. So first, let's look at the merits of the feat. 
Number one, we ignore resistance to poison damage. This is nice, though it doesn't stop us getting past immunity, but it is nice to be able to bypass resistance and add a bit more damage to our attacks against some specific enemies. Second, we're able to coat our weapons with poison as a bonus action, not an action, which is where this feat has the potential to really shine. It doesn't say that we specifically have to use the poison that this feat helps us create in order to do the bonus action instead of an action. It's any poison that we want to apply to a weapon we can do as a bonus action instead of an action. And D&D has some very powerful and potent poisons built into the system already. Plus, I'm sure your DM might come up with some also very potent poisons that if we're able to get our hands on, could come in real handy during a major combat. And the fact that any poison is going to be able to be applied to a weapon or a set of ammunition with a bonus action instead of an action for us is going to really help out our action economy in combat. And lastly, as I have alluded to, we're able to craft our own poison, which admittedly it does scale pretty poorly. It's a DC 14 con save and it just stays as a DC 14 con save. But hopefully this will work as a baby's first poison that eventually we'll be able to work up to the really big heavy hitters later on in our campaign. Now the poison that we get is, like I said, just a DC 14 con save and it deals 2d8 damage on a failed save. It's not the greatest, but it's also not the worst, especially since we're taking it right off the bat at character creation, meaning that any enemy that we're going to use it against probably isn't the strongest in terms of con saves and especially now with the DC 14, so hopefully this is the best time that we're going to get to actually make use of this feat. Mechanically, yes, some other feat like Piercer or Mobile or something else might be more practical, but for us, thematically, the Poisoner feat is probably the best way that we as a martial character are going to be able to get access to the Poison condition as well as Poison damage really early on. So, all in all, grab the Poisoner feat, make some poisons, coat your weapons, and give your enemies the worst day possible. Or don't. I can't stop you. For our stats, we're going to take our two plus ones from Human Variant in Dexterity and Charisma. So using point by as usual, it should leave us with the following stats. 8 Strength, 16 Dexterity, 14 Constitution, 10 Intelligence, 8 Wisdom, and 16 Charisma. As always, feel free to shift any of these around as you see fit but hopefully this will be our layout as we're going to want a high dexterity and a high charisma score. For our background, what we choose doesn't really matter as per usual. I'll be going with the criminal background as it feels fairly thematic since the scoundrel is supposed to be outside of typical society and possibly trying to just break it down or take what they want and be more self-interested. But feel free to mix it up as you see fit if you think there's a different background that could also work as the scoundrel sort of theme. Starting the level breakdown of the build now, at level 1 we are starting Rogue. We're also going to be staying here for pretty much the entire build since Rogue is really the only class that actually fits the theme of the Scoundrel. If you did want a multi-class, I would recommend it looking either at the Grave Domain Cleric, Hexblade Warlock, or the Alchemist Artificer. All three of these have some abilities such as the Grave Domain's Channel Divinity, Hexblade Warlock's Hexblade's Curse, or the Alchemist just kind of feels thematically appropriate, but none of them are really enough to justify taking them given that they all have access to some level of magic or healing or other abilities that the Scoundrel just doesn't really have access to in their base kit. And also, I do want to save some of these actual other subclasses for other builds where they can really shine later on. With that out of the way, what do we get at level 1? Well, we get Thieves Cant, which is kind of nice. It's just a rogue exclusive language. We also get Expertise and Sneak Attack. Sneak Attack is our bread and butter for bonus damage and is really the exact same thing as the Scoundrel's plus two damage if the enemy is adjacent to one of your allies or plus two damage if the enemy is alone. The Scoundrel has a lot of cards that deal with that sort of mechanic and Sneak Attack is essentially that mechanic. Expertise is also an amazing feature for outside of combat. There's not too much to say as Gloomhaven doesn't really deal with outside of combat. There are some downtimes and things, but there's no real challenges involved with being outside combat. So expertise is really just going to help us shine in D&D. Since we have a high dex and charisma, any of the following skills are great choices, either acrobatics, stealth, sleight of hand, deception, persuasion, intimidation. I personally would pick persuasion and stealth for a bit of both dexterity and charisma. At level 2, we get Cunning Action. 
Cunning action allows us to use our bonus action to either dash, disengage, or hide. Hide and disengage aren't really things that are done in Gloomhaven, but dash is more than welcome. The scoundrel has tons of movement, and this gives us that movement exactly. The only downside is that we don't get another way to make an offhand attack or apply our poison if we do end up using our cunning action as our bonus action. At level 3 we get our subclass, and this is where we actually start to round off the scoundrel build. It's not a super complicated build, to be honest. For our subclass, we're going to pick Swashbuckler, and while there are plenty of good options, Swashbuckler is the main option that gives us a mechanic that actually really works with the theme of the Scoundrel. Rakish Audacity? Rakish Audacity? I don't know how you would exactly pronounce it, but however you do, this feature now gives us a way to use our sneak attack if there is an enemy that is not adjacent to one of our allies or we don't have advantage against them. If we are dueling an enemy, one to one, they have no allies, we have no allies. We can still use our sneak attack against that enemy. And this is completing our isolationist build for the character. Well, not completing it, but getting the mechanics set up so that we can lock down and target a single enemy with our sneak attack very effectively. We also get a nice boost to our initiative from Fancy Footwork at this level. We're allowed to add our Charisma modifier to initiative rolls. The Scoundrel in Gloomhaven tends to act fast, and so do we. Other subclasses may have good benefits to offer that I have overlooked, but the Swashbuckler certainly feels like the right fit for the theme to me. Especially, since I'll point out, the Scoundrel literally has a card called Duelist's Advance, and the swashbuckler in D&D is nothing if not a duelist. At level 4, we're sticking with Rogue to get our first ASI slash feat. We have lots of options to pick from here. Piercer or Mobile, as I mentioned at the beginning, are both great choices. Another excellent choice would be Sentinel, as this allows us to use our sneak attack twice in one round, rather than having to wait for an opportunity attack, since Sentinel can give us a bit more of an on-demand opportunity attack, that is. You can also do an ASI and improve either Dex or Charisma by plus 2. For this build, I'm going to pick Sentinel, though, as this will absolutely let us lock down and isolate an enemy and maybe give us a bit of damage boost as well. In terms of where that fits in Gloomhaven, I would consider it a bottom attack with a mobilize. I know that the Scoundrel doesn't really have bottom attacks with a mobilize specifically, but it's close enough that we're just going to take it and run with it. For level 5, I actually have a confession. Remember a little while ago where I said we weren't multiclassing? Well, I lied through my teeth. We are going to multi-class, just nothing overly fancy. In fact, it's actually a very stupid reason, and I will not blame you if you decide completely against this. But at level 5, we're going Fighter. Fighter is going to get a second wind, which I've talked about a couple times in different videos. It's a nice self-heal, bonus action to use, 1d10 plus fighter level, all that. It's great. We also gain a fighting style, and now I know what you're thinking. Duelist, dueling, kind of perfect. And you'd be right, but that's not what we're going to pick. We are going to go with Thrown Weapon Fighting. Thrown Weapon Fighting gives us plus 2 damage on all Thrown Weapon attacks, and we can also draw and throw a weapon in the same fluid motion, so it's going to save us some action economy. Wow, it's really good, really cool, yeah. The Scoundrel does have Dagger Throwing Build, where they throw a bunch of daggers at a bunch of different targets. That could be something that we do right. Mm, not really, actually. The reason I actually picked this, stay with me, is because we're going to be picking up as much Alchemist Fire as possible and start throwing it. That's right, we're actually using Alchemist Fire, an item in D&D that is downright mediocre. Here's what it does. This sticky adhesive fluid ignites when exposed to air. As an action, you can throw this flask up to 20 feet, shattering it on impact. Make a ranged attack against a creature or object, treating the Alchemist Fire as an improvised weapon. On a hit, the target takes 1d4 fire damage at the start of its, each of its turns. A creature can end this damage by using its action to make a DC 10 dexterity check to extinguish the flames. Yeah, not very great. First of all, let's break it down. It counts as an improvised weapon, so we don't even get proficiency right away. That's not the greatest. It takes an action to throw, no matter how many attacks or anything else we have, it just says it is an action to throw it also really not great. If it does hit an enemy, it'll explode and deal 1d4 fire damage at the start of the target's turn, so not even when it just hits, and that's a yikes. But the catch there is that it takes damage until it spends its action to put out the flame. 
And this is why I like Alchemist Fire for the Scoundrel, and only the Scoundrel, really. That's as close to the wound condition as we're going to get without using magic, at least as far as I'm aware. Wound is, at the start of a creature's turn, it takes a damage. Alchemist Fire, at the start of a creature's turn, it's going to take some damage. The only reason I want this is because it's a reliable source of wound that we can actually sort of use. And now here's why I took Throne Weapon Fighting. I was hoping to buff Alchemist Fire. However, there are some issues. Alchemist Fire is not a weapon, notably. It counts as an improvised weapon when you throw it, but it's not actually a weapon, which means it also lacks the throne property. This means that both Throne Weapon Fighting, which we're taking now, and, spoiler, Quick Toss, which I hope to take in the future, are not going to work, since they specify weapons using the throne property. However, given that you are making a ranged attack, even with an improvised weapon, and that ranged attack specifies that you have to throw it towards an enemy, I would argue, and I hope your DM would agree with me on this, that Alchemist Fire in this case counts as a thrown weapon and would therefore benefit from the thrown weapon fighting style and or quick toss abilities. If not, that's fine. Rules as written, it's not actually going to work. Nothing really works with Alchemist Fire, and it's very bad. But hopefully, this will let it work. We're really boiling down to some chance here on making sure that our DM will actually let us use this. But regardless of if they do or not, I'm still going to pretend like they would, because ideally, we're not asking for a lot here. We're just asking for a way to reliably recreate Wound. At level 6, after all that stuff about Alchemist Fire, Wound, and what fighting style to pick, we're going to just continue down Fighter, and we're going to take Action Surge. Good talk. At level 7, we're going to go to Fighter 3, and this time we are grabbing a subclass. There are plenty of good options. Champions get easier crits, Samurais have on-demand advantage, etc. But we're picking Battlemaster, as I sort of alluded to before. The Battlemaster is the student of war, and while our scoundrel probably hasn't studied war as a whole, they certainly have studied dueling slash fencing. We get a couple of nice features here, but the main ones we're looking for are the maneuvers. We learn three maneuvers from the list of maneuvers available to Battlemasters, and we also gain four superiority dice, which are D8s, that we can use those maneuvers with. Now, you could choose maneuvers that you want, but I'm going to go ahead and recommend picking three of the ones from Tasha's Cauldron and Everything. Ambush, Brace, and Quick Toss. Quick Toss, as I said before, hinges on the ability to pair it with Alchemist Fire. It's easily replaceable uh, with any other maneuver if you would like, even if you don't actually want to use Alchemist Fire, even though your DM would allow it. Feel free, go right ahead. But hopefully for us, we're going to get to use that with Alchemist Fire, changing that action to throw Alchemist Fire to just a bonus action with Quick Toss. Like I said, if that's not allowed, oh well. Not much we can do about it. Ambush is a great maneuver, though, that can give us a boost to either our stealth or our initiative. It's really powerful for us, given that we're a rogue that hopefully has really high stealth, and also that we have really high initiative, so we're just going to put both of these abilities through the roof. Finally, Brace is the reason I really wanted to stick with Fighter for this long. All that stuff I said about throwing weapons and Alchemist Fire are all said and good, but Brace is a really nice extra way to get our sneak attack off on another enemy turn. Brace says that as a reaction, when a creature moves within 5 feet of us, we can make an attack against it and add the superiority die to the damage if we hit. Really, it's just like Sentinel, only this time it's more on demand, as before Sentinel was when an enemy attacks someone who isn't us, that's while we're within 5 feet of them, or when an enemy tries to move away from us and we're already next to them. This time, we can now use our sneak attack and attack against the enemy when they actually approach us. So. If an enemy tries to come towards us to get something started, we're now going to be able to just quickly jab them and hopefully hit and really damage them, if not kill them, before they even get an attack in against us. At level 8, we're going to return to Rogue and we're going to pick Uncanny Dodge. This lets us use our reaction to reduce damage from an attack that we suffer by half. We now have a lot of options for our reaction. Sentinel, Brace, and Uncanny Dodge. If an enemy moves up to you to try and tango, hit them with Brace. If they try to leave or attack an ally of us instead of us ourselves, hit them with Sentinel. 
If you're in a tough spot and you need to play more defensively, use Uncanny Dodge until you can get the heck out of there. If all of the above are happening, use your best judgment in the moment. I trust you. At level 9, we're going to continue as Rogue 6. Rogue 6 only gives us our second round of expertise, which is pretty good. And for us, I'm going to pick Investigation and Thieves Tools. They seem like the right way to go as Thieves Tools is kind of the only applicable use for expertise that actually reflects Gloomhaven. It allows us to both pick locks and potentially disarm traps. The Scoundrel, and a few other classes actually, have cards that let them do just that, disarm traps. With Investigation, we'll be able to detect these traps a lot easier, and then with the Thieves Tools expertise, be able to disarm them with relative ease as well. Unless your DM uses Perception to check for traps or something else, then in that case I would take Perception here instead of Investigation, but hopefully Investigation is what we want, and I'm just going to assume that it is. At level 10, we're going to go to Rogue 7. With Rogue 7, we're going to grab Evasion. Evasion is a very nice defensive buff that lets us scoot around AoE slash dexterity save base damage in general, and hopefully not die as much if we're going up against something like a spellcaster or big monster. There's nothing that this really reflects in Gloomhaven, but it's still a really good mechanic and we're happy to have it. At level 11, we are Rogue 8, and we get another ASI slash feat for this. Here it's time to up our dexterity by plus 2. We're very behind in terms of scaling, but hopefully we've been able to use Sentinel enough times to make up for it, and if not, well, it's time to actually try and do some catch-up. At level 12, we're Rogue 9, which is going to give us the swashbuckler feature Panache. Panache is an interesting feature as it can be used both inside and outside of combat. Outside of combat, it charms a target creature. Inside combat, though, it actually acts as a minor taunt feature. This is also something that the Scoundrel does not really have in Gloomhaven either. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The Scoundrel usually wants to make enemies attack them with either disadvantage or their allies instead, rather than just trying to tank their these hits. And while it's unfortunate that it isn't ideal for a Gloomhaven Mimic, it does work fairly nicely. It is an action to use, so it's not going to be used too often. However, there's no associated range with it. The only restriction is that we must share a language with the creature, and, we must be able, and they must be able to hear us. Telepathy would be amazing right now, but we're not a psychic creature, so we're just going to have to deal. If these two restrictions do apply, and we're out of melee range, and we don't want to throw a dagger or alchemist fire, or we're not going to get into melee range in this turn, then we could use this instead. Like it or not, we're unfortunately stuck with this feature as we want to continue up Rogue, so the time being, it's at the very least a nice way to mm, taunt enemies, but maybe you could think of it more as calling out an enemy to try and actually isolate them and get them to duel us. At level 13, we've made it to Rogue 10, which gives us another ASI slash feat. Here, I would either cap our dexterity or bump Charisma to 18. If neither of those are appealing to you, then it's time to jump back for some of the other feats that I mentioned. I, however, am going to take the plus 2 into Charisma, and honestly probably consider that and my decks as being capped. Any other ASI slash feats that we get, I would rather use as actual feats at this point. At Rogue 11, we're going to gain Reliable Talent. This is the feature that many say make rogues broken. And so anytime we make an ability check that we have proficiency with, so that's either a skill, thieves tools, or something else, and we treat any roll of 9 or lower as a 10. We're very good at what we do, because not only do we treat it as a 10 if it's 9 or lower, but we also still add on top of that our expertise, making us very good at those certain niche things, which for us are mainly disarming traps or taking care of potentially social encounters, but also more potentially out of combat encounters that are going to be relying on stealth, sneaking into places, getting past guards, or anything else of that nature. Again, there's no real Gloomhaven counterpart to this, but it does improve our panache ability and, like I said, our trap disarming abilities. At level 15, we're going to be a Rogue 12, which gives us another ASI slash feat. I said last time we got them one that I'm going to focus on feats, and so that's why I now intend to do. We're going to take mobile here to gain a bit of movement speed and that we can and so that we can ignore difficult terrain when we dash. We don't gain the full benefits of the feat, sadly, since fancy footwork already covers us for the more defensive benefit of getting to ignore enemy opportunity attacks, but even just the 10 foot speed boost uh, is great for rogues. Also, I would personally count the ignore difficult terrain as a pseudo jump type effect, even though it only triggers on dash and it doesn't actually let us cover anything that is, you know, like a chasm or something that we would actually jump over. It's close enough though, and we're probably not going to get any actual jump abilities, so we'll just 
call it jump for now and call it a day. For level 16, we are sticking with Rogue 13. We get our next swashbuckler feature, which is Elegant Maneuver. We can use our bonus action to gain advantage on our next acrobatics or athletics check this turn. And realistically, this is mostly going to be used for escaping grapples, but hopefully we never get into a situation that actually requires that. It's still a little nice bonus to have though, and technically for the rules for jumping for D&D, it could actually help us with that, which with our speed boost that we just got last effect would again, kind of boost that pseudo jump effect. We still don't have a really reliable source of jump, but it's close enough. Level 17 is Rogue 14, and we're starting to come up on the end of the build here. Rogue 14 is Blind Sense. Blind Sense gives us Blind Sense. The Scoundrel is not a class in it, Gloomhaven that can ignore invisibility, but apparently we sort of can. Now if that's going to break your immersion, then I would understand and suggest stopping Rogue before this level and going back to take Fighter for the remaining four levels. Also, the Blind Sense feature here is kind of sad, given that it's pretty much the exact same thing that the Blind Fighter fighting style, which we could have gotten a long time ago, gives us. But, oh well. We still want a couple more levels in Rogue, so we're going to have to take this now, and we're just going to have to deal with it and pretend like we have some sort of card access to be able to see invisible creatures. Although it's also not really seeing invisible creatures all the time, it's just creatures within 10 feet of us. So it's kind of a compromise, I suppose. At level 18, we're going to go up to Rogue 15. Rogue 15 gives us Slippery Mind, and Slippery Mind gives us proficiency in wisdom saves. This is a nice defensive benefit, and it makes us a little harder to mentally control or mentally incapacitate. So hopefully we'll still be able to stay in combat for as long as possible. At level 19, we're going to go to Rogue 16, and we're going to gain another ASI or feat. Here is another time to make a key decision. If we know we're going to go to Rogue 17, which I am going to, then we should either take a straight up feat with no ASI built in, or we should take a plus two to Dex, Charisma, or even Con. If you'd rather jump back to Fighter for an additional ASI slash feat, then we could do something like a half feat here, or even cap both our decks and Charisma. But since I said I was going to consider our decks and Charisma as capped, and I want to go to Rogue 17, I'm going to take a basic feat for our build. Do whatever makes you happy though, and what is the last feat we're going to get? I'm so glad you asked. We're going to take the Lucky Feat. Honestly, this is probably mechanically one of the best feats for us to take, if not one of the best feats in the game. Really, I think Dungeon Delver would be a bit more thematic as it helps us get past the traps in terms of giving us resistance to trap damage and also being able to detect them a lot easier. However, at level 19, I don't think I can in good conscience recommend Dungeon Delver given that we're probably already past a level where traps really bother us. And even if they do bother us, we're still going to be able to reliably find and disarm them on our own without the feat. Lucky, on the other hand, lets us reroll three rolls per day or lets us have the DM reroll three times per day. So save them for key moments like missing a crucial sneak attack or getting crit by a big bad enemy. You can also take Sharpshooter here if you found that you were throwing daggers and darts a lot more often, but for us, Lucky's gonna be the way to go. And even though there's no Gloomhaven mechanic that it rep represents, it thematically feels like a scoundrel would have some element of luck on their side, along with the actual skill that they have built up. Finally, at level 20, we have made it to Rogue 17, which gives us our last swashbuckler feature, Master Duelist. This was the reason why I wanted to get up to Rogue 17 so badly. It means that we finally mastered what it means to be a scoundrel. With Master Duelist, we can reroll one missed attack roll per short or long rest. Now, while that may not sound like much, it does mean that we'll have far better odds on that one crucial sneak attack turn. Plus, it takes away some of the pressure of having to use our luck points that we just got on our own attacks and instead use that feature for defense first. In short, both this plus the lucky feat are some very easy access strength and abilities, which the scoundrel doesn't have any built in strength and abilities, but strength to any class in Gloomhaven is always really amazing, and for us, it's definitely amazing since it will mean more sneak attack. The other thing I should mention as we have gotten to level 20, aka Rogue 17, is that our sneak attack has been leveling up this entire time. It started off as a measly 1d6 on all of our weapon attacks, which of course was pretty much just once per turn, but this time it's actually gotten all the way up to 9d6 on all of our weapon attacks, including the ones that happen off our turn. That's a 
pretty potent amount of damage for at least one attack. Not multiple, maybe, but still. Our attacks are also very reliable with ways to reroll them, so that makes us a pretty potent damage dealer, which is really what the Scoundrel has always been about. All right, let's summarize this build. For starters, we are quite the duelist. We have tons of mobility, we excel at locking down single enemies or finishing enemies off, and we can do a bit of poison, wound, and immobilizing. We even have a bit of strength thrown in, so we have lots of conditions to work with from Gloomhaven. We can disarm traps extremely well and mix it up in combat, whether at range or in melee. That all sounds like the scoundrel to me. In D&D terms, we have a wealth of options for both our bonus action and our reaction, so try not to let analysis paralysis get the best of you. That happens for me the time to time. We have a whopping 96 on our sneak attack, as I said, which is a lot of damage. Plus, we can throw some extra damage in with our battle master maneuvers. We are also extremely skilled with about seven skills, and maybe you could pick up more along the way, but three of which have expertise, plus our expertise in thieves tools, coupled with reliable talent and lucky, technically, though we don't necessarily want to use lucky for skills, but we can. We're very good at what we do. Finally, there's one thing that I sort of alluded to, but never fully touched on besides the beginning, and that is Poisoner. The benefits of the Poisoner feat, as I had said, apply to more than just the poison that the feat gives you. That means that we should have hopefully gotten Drow Poison, Purple Worm Poison, anything else that's built into D&D or that's homebrewed by your DM. And at high levels, I would hopefully think that we have found some really potent poisons at this, by this point. Finding these really powerful poisons, we can get a few vials of them, coat our weapons, still as a bonus action, and then dish out even more massive damage. Obviously, poison is still subject to immunity, so don't get too willy-nilly with it. But, like a scoundrel, think about the enemy and the obstacles in front of you, pick the right equipment for the job, and bring with you what you're going to need to really get past any sort of challenge. Let me know what you thought of the build, or what you would change to get a bit closer to the theme of the Gloomhaven character class, and I'm so glad to have you along for the journey. Hope to see you in the next one.